But it all begins with a very harmless gateway drug, my favourite drug, tea. Now you'll remember that we talked about coffee making its way to Britain before tea did in major quantities. Coffee houses like Old Slaughter's Coffee House, which is where our very first episode uh, began and where uh, James Figg said that he'd find an opponent for the Venetian gondolier back in the uh, late 1600s. The first tea to make it to the UK apparently uh, was in the possession of a Portuguese princess. Obviously, if you um, know any Portuguese history, or in fact, if you know any British history, a lot of it is us trotting around the globe and opening ports in various countries, uh, only to find out that the Portuguese have got there first. The Portuguese are a fantastically busy seafaring nation. Uh, the best example is the slave trade, wherein the Portuguese got to the African coast and bought slaves first, and then the British turned up and turned it into you know a, a worldwide enterprise of effectively evil <laughs> but a portuguese princess brings tea to the uh, to great britain and uh, feeds it to some of the royal court uh, in 1660 samuel pepys records in his diary that he tries tea a china drink and in 1664 uh, the east india company places its first order in china for a crate of tea totaling 100 pounds in weight but within five years, the shipment per year is up to £1,300. And it is in 1669 that ships begin to sail annually for Canton. Tea is all the rage in Britain. Um, some people don't know how to eat it. Even the, the, There's accounts of people uh, like mashing up tea with, uh, with hot water and then spreading it on toast and, and saying, mm, I'm just not into this tea stuff. Um, but it, it combined later on with our love of sugar, which came from, uh, obviously, uh, the Americas. And by adding milk and sugar to tea, you've made a, a quintessentially English drink of something that was uh, typically drunk just straight on its own in China. And a lot of this is, of course, um, just showing opulence. You know, it's a good way to show your wealth if you can get uh, tea when only... Uh, a few hundred pounds of it are coming into the country every year. Uh, and of course, if you add a couple of spoonfuls of sugar to, to your cups of tea, uh, you are showing how incredibly wealthy you are. Uh, you know, reportedly, Londoners would show off their blackened teeth uh, very proudly because, the, you know, sugar was the thing that did it. Uh, and others would artificially blacken their teeth if they couldn't afford sugar and tea to do it for them. A fashion which has continued to this day, if you're, if you're an American listening to this and you uh, know what English smiles typically look like. But for the most part, the British trade with China up until the early 18th century, 1700s, uh, that's always confusing when I, when I write so-and-so century, um, silk and porcelain are the main items of value coming back from China. Silk has been a value item for hundreds if not thousands of years at this point. Obviously, the Silk Roads uh, through Asia from China were incredibly instrumental in setting up trade between China and the West. The Romans were trading with the Chinese from the first century BC, uh, and they would buy silk from the Chinese in various forms, and then if it came in some kind of design, they would unpick it and try and restitch it into their own preferred design. They had no, no interest in any Chinese creation. They wanted the textile itself. Silk, of course, is um, manufactured from the... Well, it's made by mulberry uh, silkworms. And there's a whole process by which you get their cocoons and you uh, throw them in... Uh, is, I think it's boiling water. And you unravel them and then you re-ravel them on a, on a spool like you would a thread. But obviously that was of incredible value to the world. And, and that's why um, the Silk Roads were called the Silk Roads. And China still accounts for something like 70% of the silk in the world today exported that is porcelain of course is, is also incredibly valu valuable in its own right however traders quickly work out that they can uh, reproduce or you know at least attempt to reproduce porcelain uh, in the uk there's a company called the new canton porcelain company uh, opens up just down the road from the east india company's main london docks uh, in 1747 but the thing that makes silk and tea uh, fairly unique is that uh, both of them come from, well, not plants, but both of them come from uh, creatures that are non-native to the UK. And of course, their production is incredibly well uh, protected. At this point, no European has ever seen the Chinese tea fields. The different kinds of black and green tea, um, There's, I think there's four types of black tea and, and a couple of types of uh, green tea that are popular around this time. The English believe them all to be different plants. They are, in fact, all just differently prepared. And it's a source of tremendous frustration that the, the British can't get their hands on this knowledge and start working to produce tea their set themselves. But tea, despite being a fashionable trend 
isn't particularly profitable uh, until late in the 18th century. It's very much a luxury good, uh, and the import duties on it are very, very high. The first tariff cut on the, on the tea taxes comes in uh, 1747, and at that point it goes from just 3% of all of the value of the East India Company's Asian imports, which includes um, India, which is where the company is mainly based, uh, to almost 20%. One figure says that uh, in 1720, uh, tea was bringing in £200,000 for the company, and by 1770, it's bringing in £9 million. Uh, another figure says that in 1760, uh, £6 million is brought in a year per, uh, by tea, and that it accounts for 40% of all East India Company business. But after that um, 1747 price cut and the demand going up, uh, the taxes on tea start to creep up again. Uh, of course, the Boston Tea Party very famously was over um, stamp duty and things like that, but also over the the, uh, the tax on tea. Uh, hence, they threw the crates of tea into the Boston Harbour. And there's a great song about it by the uh, sensational Alex Harvey Band. But the thing about these rising taxes is that they serve to screw over the East India tr uh, Trading Company. And the East India Trading Company, I mean, we'll talk more about them in, in depth in a second. The East India Trading Company is sort of the commercial wing of the British government. It's a private company, um, but you've got to remember that at this point, not everyone is allowed to vote. Government is still sort of run by a, an old boys club or a young rich boys club. Uh, and a lot of the members of parliament have individual interests within the trading company. Uh, the East India Trading Company was originally commissioned by Queen Elizabeth and given a, a formal monopoly on uh, Asian trade. What that means in practice is that the company is the only British company that can bring tea to the UK. But there are sort of ways around this. Uh, Jardine and Matheson, who are uh, competitors with the company later on, uh, they begin shipping tea to the UK via the Netherlands um, and other European countries. And of course, smuggling is always an option too, um, because of the incredibly high taxes. What this means is that um, in the years up to 1784, which is when the Commu uh, Commutation Act is passed uh, and changes all the taxing on tea, uh, in the years up to that, the... East India Company is supposed to have the complete run of tea coming into the uh, into Britain, uh, but it only accounts for 40% of tea consumed in Britain. When the Commutation Act is passed and cuts tea duties from 119%, so more than the value of the tea is tax, to just 12.5%, people are more willing to pay the full price for tea, so smuggling of tea becomes less important because you can smuggle more um, illicit goods that are going to net you more money, and the East India Company's share of uh, tea brought in, into Britain goes up to 85% of total, including all outside trading companies and things coming through Europe. By 1833, which is when we start kicking things off in Canton, £33 million is being made from the East India Company's tea. Or if you're not big on numbers, another way to illustrate that is that initially tea was bought and then used to uh, pack porcelain with uh, when shipping it back from China. Uh, the porcelain was more valuable, but you needed something there to stop it breaking. By the height of tea, uh, the company is commissioning ships with 50% more hull capacity, enormous fucking ships, uh, to bring back as much tea as possible and then using porcelain as ballast to balance the ship. There's no Suez Canal at this point, so we're talking sailing around the Cape of Good Hope to get to the East Indies and back, so a voyage could take a significant uh, amount of time. Uh, in 1826, there's 34 individual crossings between Canton and the UK on behalf of the company. So tea is everything. And even taxing at a much lower rate, tea accounts for around 10% of the uh, UK government's budget. While um, addiction is obviously something we save more for uh, serious drugs like opium, um, it, it you know you could say that the uh, British public was addicted to tea at this point. They relied so heavily on it, and the British government relied so heavily on it for income that the complete lack of control or understanding of the business um, really grew to frustrate both the government and the East India Company. At this time, the only place that tea is grown in significant um, quantities and to the taste that uh, the British public expect uh, is China, or the Qing Empire, as it was called uh, in the day, because we're in the Qing Dynasty now.